All right, so people will wander in, but um, the first thing that I want you to observe here is that I am recording my screen, and so I'm also recording my microphone on the laptop. So after this is done, if you want a copy of the video or the slides, you can email me here. So then I'll ship it you a, a Dropbox uh, URL, and then you'll be able to get a copy of it. So if you have concerns about having your voice on here, let me know. But it's just my screen being recorded. So <laughs> well, I am not Darren, but this is your class. All right. So that'll be available. If you want a copy, just email me. And then let's get Right. So I don't know. Did Darren tell you that he was going to be gone, or is that a shock? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Plus shocking then. So normally I teach 601. So I'm just subbing tonight. Um, hopefully these notes don't say 601, but they should say 602. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> um, so the first thing that I like to go over is what are the ground rules that that you have, right? So like, you've all taken classes before, and you have some expectation of how they should run. So my, you when we get started here is like, how do you want your class run? I mean, I I talk a lot. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's what everyone prefers, but fairness is good. Engagement. Awesome. Okay. So, by the way, the reason I'm collecting your input is not just so that I can look at it, but so that we can actually do that. So, this is you shaping your class tonight. Welcome. For those of you who have just arrived a little late, uh, we have name tags up front with markers. And then uh, we are recording my screen. And right now, what we're doing is we're collecting what the consensus is about how the class should be run. Anyone else? Thought provoking. Thought provoking. That's good. Is there a difference between thought provoking and engaging? Yeah, I think engaging means prompting me to speak and be in front ah, of the class. Okay. Thought provoking means me you're presenting with me new ideas. Okay. Sort of interactive. <clears throat> okay. Speaking of interactive, getting to like do stuff, so not just like talking back and forth, but activity. So that, so interactive in both sort of like back and forth verbally, but also interactive talking. Okay, so like we'll take verbal and doing. Kinesthetic. <laughs> Got to throw in those educational buzzwords. Anything else? <laughs> By the way, the people who speak control the class. So if you're not speaking, you're just here. All right, so that that so I'm super happy to hear we've got three inputs. Those are all things that I hope to do tonight. So that totally fits my plan. That's good. <laughs> all right, so although I'm not teaching you machine learning tonight, what I can offer you is sort of my perspective on data science and also my role as a person in the government who flitters with data science occasionally. So. Um, this is what I want you to be able to walk away with. If you have questions about what it's like to be in the game as a person who talks to data scientists, I may even be one sometimes, you can certainly ask. And then as a prompt, at the end of class, I'm going to collect your feedback about what wasn't clear and, and what was useful to you. So just know that in the future, this is coming as a question. So you can sort of note that. All right. So. <laughs> I'm going to put a check mark when we're doing things. So I'm going to check off this doing thing. Because the first thing that we're going to do is count off by how many? So we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Perfect. All right. So count off by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then form groups of three with people who have your same number. OK, so this isn't crazy advanced, but I'm going to start over here by numbering people, and then we'll just work our So when you count off your number verbally, Remember what your number is, okay? Because we're going to use that later. One, two, three. Five. Five. Okay. No, one. One, two, three. 
Okay. Yeah. Three. Four. Five. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. All right. This is the do part. Do. <laughs> right. So what we're going to do is form groups of people with the same number. You actually have to physically move. I think the one should come over here. <laughs> Dominate. <laughs> I will revisit your group once we've got groups together. So every group should have three people. If there's not, we fail the parish check. Yeah. Good. Good. One, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So once you're forming your groups, the the task for the, your group is to come up with three costs of doing data science, three benefits of doing data science, and three risks. One. So I'll give you about. A few minutes to talk about it, maybe three to four minutes, and then we'll reconvene as a group for this interesting clustering. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> However you want to spin that, that's a totally open to it. I think these are very good aspects to dive into. Yeah. In the group, three calls, three benefits, three risks It's not me, it's just a data science in general. Well, yeah, it's not me. Well, no, I get that. I get that. It's not me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess it's a good argument. I guess that frees us to do something else. Right, right. I think the risk is. Well, okay, another two minutes or so, and then we'll finish up. If you haven't got your nine by now.
software, My infrastructure. infrastructure. Okay. Someone else will be talking? So like human capital. Yeah. Okay. Other costs? Collecting data. Okay. So that takes work. Sometimes some of the data sets, especially in you know, health related problems, are kind of personal. Um, so, you know, privacy potentially, big cost, or it could be a risk as well. No, I think I'm going to put that on a risk. So, is a privacy risk? Or there's a, so, we'll, so there's a risk of loss of privacy, and then there's like a cost of like protecting it. I'll put that on it. Who has a benefit? Find uh, newer answers or find answers quicker okay. for whatever your data is. So faster discovery. Faster. Hmm? Discovery, faster discovery. Okay. Okay. So just sort of like a like an educational sense or sort of wisdom. Yeah. Okay. You also have a benefit? Um, is there more complex problems than maybe traditional techniques allow? Okay, so address complexity. Speaking on behalf of myself, I'll say gainful employment. <laughs> More risk. Do I have a risk? Be biased, you know. Okay. And that's so the outcome is biased, or the person doing it is biased. Yeah, like you're trying to predict who should get a job. Rates was what you said to the variable. So it's maybe undesirable bias, right? Because we, we build machines so that they can bias towards things we want them to do. Right. Okay. Obsolescence of all, a lot of the tools and techniques. So high turnover rate? Mm -hmm. Other risk? Someone I haven't heard from, maybe? So I'm, by the way, I'm getting paid by Howard to be here, so. <laughs> failure. A risk of failure. Nice. All right, so, I don't, and so my curiosity, so we've got some stuff up on the whiteboard. Is these things that you've considered before about the career you're going into, something that you maybe have acknowledged and are aware of, or like, was this useful, right? That's the question. If it's not, I take feedback. All right, you can maybe desert this, disperse back to your original desk.
So there is a guy who has a Wikipedia entry, not because he's famous, but because he wrote some useful, which is um, sort of a, a diagnosis of when there is no response from an audience. Like, what does that mean or imply? And so this was more personal because, like, I used to work with Brian Warnock. Like, he's a real person, and like, there's a Wikipedia entry. That's cool. So, so this is like just a disclaimer of like, this is how I think of my interaction with you. So of, like. <laughs> One, one way of addressing that is to actually just respond. All right, so um, we've done a little bit of exercise. Now I'm going to give you a break, and you're going to listen to uh, my bio. And you can uh, ask questions as we proceed. So I used to work as a mechanic on an aircraft for the Air Force. So I was in the military for seven years. That's the plane that I worked on. Not the plane, but the same model. <laughs> I did actually try to find one that I worked on, but I didn't see it. Um, and then I went on from being a mechanic to being a physicist, which is a bit of a transition. So I worked specifically in high performance computing and uh, did simulations in physics on really large computers down in Texas. Um, that's where the computers were, at least. So that was pretty useful training because it turns out physicists like to model things and use really big computers, which is effectively what I do for the government now. So as a physicist, the training, my background is, I would consider it a scientist. Right? And the, the way that I think about science, and this maps directly into what I think a data scientist should be good at, is making observations, figuring out you know, why are those things asked, why are those things occurring, and then coming up with some story, right, basically a model, that is quantitative in nature. Right, that's the, the part where you get to apply your math skills. And then the utility of is what so what differentiates a mathematical model from just a story is the fact that you can make quantitative predictions. And then those are testable, which reinforce your hypothesis, right? So that's what distinguishes a data scientist from a data analyst. And um, a data analyst is just someone who characterizes data. And so I'm I'm not sure how to reinforce that point, but if you're not doing science, then you're just a data analyst. And so, like, if you throw like all your machine learning models at your data, and you say, "Well, that one worked," <laughs> I, I, I get the the handle of a data analyst. And so, it, has has that been uh, something that Darren has reinforced in this class or not? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, like, I, this is my this is my fear of like. So, why do I enjoy teaching? Not just because I like to hear myself talk, but because I think I may have some impact on like how people operate in the real world in the sense that when you leave here, if someone hands you a question and you go off and chase the data, right, and then you throw whatever the hot machine learning model is with some GPUs at it, right, and you think, ha ha, data science. Like, <laughs> that's like the refrain that I hear, right? Like, that, that's what qualifies you as a data scientist, and I, I have to disagree with that. <laughs> Did a little bit of science for a little while. <laughs> so so my, my hope is that when you're, um, going off into the real world that you actually have some statistical background for the claims that you're making and then um, can validate the model or invalidate it rather than just saying, well, it worked just as spaghetti sticks to the wall when I throw it at it. Right? That's not really data science in my opinion. All right. So, oops, so that's hmm, interesting. So the, I had changes to data 601, so I'm not statistically so I'm not sure why that's up. The, the, the application when you leave here is not so much that people like data scientists, it's that they like the outcomes of data science, right? And, and why does that matter? Because in a large organization, so can I get a show of hands? Who here works in a large organization or has worked in a large organization? All right, so roughly half the class. And so my claim to you is, and that's what this Harvard Business Review article sort of says, is that most of the issues faced by businesses not technical in nature. <laughs> so then why are they hiring data scientists, right? Like, like what's the what's the deal, right? And, and the answer is like, <laughs> so that first one, like politics, turf wars, sort of lack of consensus about what the business is doing, <laughs> that's not data science, right? But the point is that typically you have like people who are in the CEO position, the you know, chief executive officer, chief financial officer, and basically they have experience and they have opinions. 
And that's how you sort of like duke things out. Right? And that same thing happens in the research field, in academics, it happens in government, right? People who have to make decisions have to have a basis for making those decisions. And so the hard part of data science to me is not choosing which algorithm is relevant or you know chasing that data set, right? It's how do you translate your result as a person who did the data science to something that makes a difference along these lines, which are much more uh, spongy and sort of like subjective. And, and that's that's where the the hard part for me is, right? Of like the data science part. So literally, <laughs> I did this measurement. Um, I spent the month of October figuring out how much time I spend doing certain tasks at a five, my five minute increment resolution. Every five minutes, I wrote down what I was doing, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so the outcome of that was that like 60% of my time is spent in meetings. <laughs> so no one here is taking a class on taking meetings, I think, right? Like that's not a class UMBC offers as far as I know. But that's how a lot of my time is spent. And so like the actual time spent doing research and data science was about 5%. <laughs> so that's sort of like what you should prepare yourself for is like when you leave here and you do data science for someone, that's where all the time gets spent. So, so by the way, that's, so why I do all these fun games and exercises? Like we'll do a couple of these tonight, not because I like fun games and exercises. I mean, they're cool, but because I want to help you develop the skills of talking to other people and resolving differences and communicating effectively. Because when you leave here, that's probably what's gonna make the difference. Right? If, if they interview you and you get in, that means they think you have the skills to do the technical things. But it doesn't actually say whether or not you're a good person in that large organization. All right, so I don't have, this was a, an article that just came out recently, but this is very, very typical to me. So there's a, a I think it was Boston needs um, the ability to route their school buses more effectively, right? So Boston is a large city with lots of students. And so getting the students from their house to the school is the challenge, right? And the longer the bus route, right, the more money you spend on diesel and bus repairs. There's a costly sort of optimization that we could do, right? So this is where they throw the machine learning data scientists at the problem. And the scientists come back and they say, we've got a more efficient solution that it will cost the city less money, right? And and the and the and the bureaucrats are like, right? Money savings, like we can go spend them on other things, which is great. <laughs> Except now there's a, a backlash from the parents because right. So you've got some of your kids are going to school at like 6:30 a.m. and some are going at like 8:45 a.m. and like coming home at 2:30 and then like arriving back at 4:30. And so like from the parents' perspective, this optimized bus routing schedule that was presented as a result of this research, screws with your day. <laughs> and, and so the, there's this huge backlash, and so the parents talk to the politicians and like, we're not voting you back in office if you do this. Right? So the politicians like, whoa, we'll just you know go back to the old schedule, which was may, way more inefficient, but may, like didn't make the population as unhappy. And so this is something where, um, as a machine learning sort of person who wants to optimize things, that's great, but the consequences are going to be impacting people. And so having some sense of where that falls out is very useful. Because like these people probably spend weeks, if not months, optimizing the bus schedule using these different machine learning techniques. And then it was all wasted. <laughs> um, right, so <laughs> although I've talked about this, that's not what I do most of the day. My actual day, like I wake up, I go to work around nine, and I come home five every day. Right? That's like my normal office day, Monday through Friday. So the <laughs> there's a ton of flexibility. Like I basically show up when I want, but that's another issue. Um, and that's good. Um, and I actually get to work just 40 hours a week. And so like there's um, you can't work more than that, <laughs> which is great. Like if you've ever worked in an organization where they want you to be there working for 60 hours a day or 60 hours a week, it's really annoying after a long time. So being constrained to only work 40 hours is really nice. And I show up, I read the 20 to 30 emails I've got in my inbox. Right? As I said, I go to a bunch of meetings, try to run some of those meetings. 
So some of the meetings are formal, where it's like scheduled. Mm, mostly, maybe half of them are impromptu, right? Like I ambush someone at their desk and talk to them for 20 minutes, and then they go, I go away. And then very near the bottom, this is where like the more technically oriented things, like that's not very much of my time is spent there. So, so that's like a normal office worker, I would argue, is like basically that. The fun thing to me is that none of my days repeat and nothing's predictable. So having that uncertainty is something that I value. If I came to work and I knew what I was going to do that day, I would be like so bored. <laughs> so, you know, so if you're looking, if you're in this career field and you're thinking, I'm going to have a stable job where I know what I'm doing, you're wrong. You should probably leave. Yeah. So if you're if you're here for the instability, that's good. All right. So you might think, well, that's pretty boring, right? <laughs> and you're wrong. So I definitely have seen people sort of like get stuck in the white collar off worker mode of like being bored and just reading emails and being unfortunately sad. But um, <laughs> that's not how I live. And that's not to say that it's all happiness because there is depression, right? So like you go along stretches where like you find no new results, like weeks on end. Like you discover something, and you're like woohoo, right? And that woohoo only lasts for about an hour or two, <laughs> because then it's on to the next problem, <laughs> right? So, so that's something to be aware of if you're used to that. All right. So, I mentioned a lot of the sort of positive aspects. Um, who here has heard of flex time or like comp time? No one familiar with that? Or two head nods. All right. So the idea there is, I only get to work 40 hours per week. But if I work more than that, I can sort of bank that, um, and then like the next week or the you know the week after, spend that time and not eat into my leave schedule. So like I don't uh, use up my annual leave. That's it. Did I explain that clearly? You just get the input back. What do you mean input? Like if I work extra one week, and I can work less the next week, basically, up to 24 hours of sort of slot. Like a lot of people will work like a nine-hour day. So like you're in control. Yeah. Yeah. Question? No. Some people do, but I do not. So I don't get work done. <laughs> All right. And then uh, five weeks of vacation. So that's cool. Right. So I'm setting you up with like a bunch of positive factors. I'm going to show you all the negative ones next. <laughs> all right. So in a large organization, there's a lot of bureaucracy. So what does that mean in the ground? It means that if you want to do a thing and you're super pumped and you've got all the knowledge and you don't know how to do it, you're probably not going to do it for another few weeks. Right? And that can be really aggravating. right? When you know how to do something, there's a clear need for it, and you're not being allowed to do it. And so the cons so how does that arise? right? Be typically because someone else needs to approve the work you're doing. right? Maybe, so as a data scientist, in applying a machine learning technique, it's highly likely that no one has ever done what you want to do before. So you're doing something novel, right? That's totally to be expected, but your organization isn't used to that. And so you're going to have to convince them, not only can I do it, right, but it's the useful thing to do for my business, and um, it won't harm anyone, right? And so like. All this sort of convincing of people of like this is the right thing to do can take a long time. That's where all those meetings accumulate. So, anyone have any bureaucracy stories? We had a half the class in work. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we're, we're currently working on a, <laughs> it. It's taken like seven months to get certain people on contract mm -hmm. to work. I mean, contracts. Who, who here is familiar with contracts? Just oh god, there's just. All right, yeah, we're gonna tell the yeah. contract story. But go ahead. Anything else? Oh yeah, just just you have to spend money at a certain rate. We can't <laughs> spend money until we have them on contract. Good so idea. now we have to figure out how to spend seven, eight months worth of money in one month, so that it looks like our average rate is a thing. But then they they don't have that many hours literally available. So just yeah, contracts and grants, all of that, all of that, so much budget. Do you have any good stories? No. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
the, the, there's two ways, right? So if you know this is going to happen, right? You know that bureaucracy is an issue. There's, in my book, two ways to respond to it, or maybe three. So you could ignore it, which I don't do. But you could become very depressed, which is super common, right? So imagine your work environment filled with about 80 to 90 percent of people who are frustrated, depressed, and angry. <laughs> That's a large organization, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, like, I hop around like a little bunny, and be like, what about this? What about this? Right? <laughs> and so. It, I have a different attitude, I guess, but maybe you can tell from the shirt. So the the issue there, so there was a wise move made back in the government, and I won't say whether it was wise or not, but um, they said the government shouldn't do all the work. We should hire that out to private contractors, right, so that we can fund the American way of doing business rather than having this huge bloated government. So now we have a huge bloated government, you know, with all the workers in the contractor force. So we hire people to do a job under a contract rather than making a full government employee, which hypothetically makes the, the government more flexible. It also means all of your intellectual capital and sort of like not to do things is in people who you've hired under a contract. And then you have to get manage them as government. And that, that is really complicated. So it makes things tough. But the other thing that Claire was mentioning is like so spend rates. So if I'm the government your contract is to spend a million dollars for the year, you have to show that you're actually spending that money during the work, right? whether or not you actually are doing the work. So that's <laughs> There's all these sort of like little fun gotchas. On the plus side, if you learn how to handle contracts and spend rates correctly, you might <laughs> The skill set Ever. is, right. Like there are very few university classes like on how to manage a government contract, as far as I would imagine. All right, the other fun thing, so you get to hop around as like a technical person trying to do your your analysis on some data, but you typically don't have the authority that you need to take action. And so what that requires is going off to other people to talking them that if they have a little bit of the authority, they should allow you to do that thing. And that's where a lot of time gets spent see figuring out who has the authority, convincing them that it's the right thing to do, and then like them actively engaging with you to enable your process. All right. As I mentioned, there's a huge pool of the workforce who like is just angry and frustrated because of all these problems. So that's something that you should uh, have a have a way of dealing with. Maybe large organizations are typically very um, risk averse. I literally, I literally don't know why this is because like the U.S. government is not going to fail, right? A state government is not going to fail. At worst, like their bond rating, their bond rating may go down, right? But I'm not sure where the risk aversion comes from because it's really hard to fire a government employee. So where that comes from, I'm not sure. And then in any organization, whether you're a commercial business, whether you're doing research or in the government, there's lots of legal constraints. So even though technically you might be able to accomplish a specific outcome, right, and you have the data and you have a business need for it, you have to validate through the lawyers that it's a thing that you can do. Now that's in addition to showing that it's profitable and it won't kill anyone. All right, so these are all issues that hopefully are on your mind when you're listening to Darren speak about all these fancy math things. Because that's not where most of your time is going to be spent. Basically, you're saying don't work for the government. Keep on getting out of it. <laughs> so, so, there are a lot of great reasons. So, so there's some trade offs, right? If you, want, if you want the ability not to, right? So I can't be fired, basically, effectively, right? I, I'd have to really go to be fired, which is a great thing if you want stability. It also means that all of your shitty coworkers. But you also don't know they, what you're doing every day, so you don't like stability. So if you were to be a contractor, if you were to be a contractor, then you could make a little bit more money. You're not going to get fired because you have a PhD. <laughs> and then you can embrace the inherent chaos. Well, so you might actually be happier. Actually, that could be. I haven't tipped my water. So I'm a government employee, by the way, not a contractor, as Richard's pointing out. So. I'm a contractor, and uh, I I'm treated <laughs> as a uh, individual, like self-employed, so I get to pay extra taxes. So uh, and they and they also don't take taxes out or stuff for health insurance out. So I ended up with like a thousand dollars in extra tax that I didn't want to pay to supposed to pay last year. So like, there's, contractors not the perfect life. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's contractor. As an independent contractor, such as that, and then there's a contractor, which I think he's talking about, it's like as a sub, as a government contractor, where you work for a company, 
but you're on a contract, in which case the contracting company takes care of all that and stuff for you. <laughs> yeah, so typically the government has really big, complicated projects that they work on, and so they hire a really big, complicated company to manage that project for them. A really big, complicated contract. And so literally contracts can run into like 50, 100 pages of like technical legalese about all the things that are supposed to happen, the sequence in which they happen, the deliverables, who's doing what, where, and all these good things. What happens if the government fails? What happens if the company fails? Right? All these sort of possibilities need to be enumerated so that people know what the consequences are. So it's really complicated. <laughs> all hell bricks is. <laughs> and the government goes, most common bid, so they get the cheapest work and hope that it works. <laughs> Right, so in an effort to save money, right, like the, the government has to bid out to say like a multitude of companies, but they're going to go for the lowest price option, right? In quality, you, you, you get what you pay for, so it's exciting. All right, <laughs> not sure whether I've been. I mean, I had a surgery and it cost me 50 bucks, like in hospital, so like just going to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, right, as I was mentioning earlier, um, you see in large organizations is typically decision makers are faced with um, hard problems that they need to solve and in a very timely manner, right? They're typically behind deadline and they really need that, that, that problem solved. And so, if you're not doing data science, what is it exactly that they're doing? Right? Because most managers aren't data scientists. And so they'll rely on you, hopefully, to get your quantitative analysis of the problem right, done effectively against the right amount of data with the right tools. Right? <laughs> you want to pray. Right? But typically, I've seen these other methods um, which are not as useful, but they're still in use. And so that's sort of like you're not walking into a pristine environment. You, as a data scientist, have to displace the current methodologies that have been used historically. So the, the challenge there is that someone has a very, like I've been a, let's say I've been a manager for 30 years in the government, I'm very highly ranked, right, and I have thousands of decisions behind me. And so like I have a track record that is well established that I'm a decision maker. <laughs> I didn't say good decision maker, I said decision maker. And so the challenge there is that when you waltz in there with your fancy math that no one understands using code that no one else can read, Right? How is that more trustworthy than the track record that I, as a decision maker, the thoughts of authority have established? So that's what you'll be displacing when you walk into a real job. Oh, I should take a break. All right, I'm gonna get a few more slides, I think. But we'll do this last one, take a break. Uh, all right. So <laughs> the sad, the sad news that you should emotionally prepare yourself for is the fact that. All of your fancy tools and all of your techniques with all of your data doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to listen to you. So this is something that, again, if you're emotionally prepared for this outcome, it's, it's not as shocking, right? The first time you encounter it, you're like, what? They didn't listen to me, but I had the right answer. <laughs> that is a response that is sadly common, right? And so if you're prepared for that, um, people make decisions on other bases rather than being right. All right, with that positive news, we will take a break and come back at So I, was, I was very frustrated, by the way, when like my bosses asked me if I wanted to join them in the Mega Millions lottery. I was like, no, no, I do not. <laughs> my uh, my parents were in a trade competition for uh, people who work in the lottery industry. Okay. So on marketing stuff. So uh, my go-to answer is like, my family's gotten everything from the lottery we didn't get. Uh, <laughs>
I gave the same talk to a then the 601 class for our student, which is, yeah, he was in. So, but gently, he's not coming back. But there was one more person? Uh, but I believe that Daniel, but he was also in that. Ah, okay. Perfect. Good. That was a wise decision at first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we're back, I guess. So my question to you is, um, what are your backgrounds? Because I, this is around personal enrichment. Maybe you invited me. I'm a volunteer. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Before you became a student of the good Database what? Database that. Okay. Um, background in software training, I do uh, machine learning and power. I have a PhD in psychology, but working in cyber network systems, I know I can take data to more complicated systems. Okay. Well, put it on the site. So you are gainfully employed as a data scientist now? Okay. So I use So maybe an analyst? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's cool. And so, one of the, if I, if I had you as real students, not as a fake student, um, one of the things I like to do is try and tell stories that are leveraging the students' backgrounds that are in my classes. And so, this is addressing my students. A lot of diversity. Okay, so he has an analyst. Okay, so we'll put on two X here. Uh, I think, uh, okay, and you not 
now we're doing what? Oh, I got hired by a contractor. <laughs> I was not expecting a two X there. <laughs> All right, cool. All right. So that's that's very interesting to me because in the other classes that I've talked to, I don't think there's been as much diversity. So I don't quite understand how that came up. Cool. I think I have one more survey of yours. Um, so it sounds like so a few of you. I think are going to stay in your current employment as a data scientist potentially. Is that reasonable? Like you're sort of like gaining skills, but going to remain with the career. For those of you who are not, where are you see yourself going with whatever it is that you're going to be seeing part of today? Do you expect to be a data scientist, or where is that going? So, mm, so disease surveillance, but within your current employment, or can um, you change? Well, can you guys that like have to are picked by the Okay. So you're basically left positioning yourself for a future career change. So um, I can't think of the reason. Changing teams to the same thing. So I'm gonna make sure there. Does anyone have anything besides one of these three? Okay. In psychology or in data science? Um, psychology, but we said it's not. Okay. Well, that are... Okay. So that's, yeah. So you're enabling your future success. Okay. It's a very good idea to be a quant person. Is there any field where it's not it's from day quant? It's particularly good in humanities field yeah. where you for sure. backbone is quant. <laughs> you know, oh, you teach stats for everyone, you never find it. <laughs> You'll never teach that. Yeah. Yeah, that's not what people go into psychology. They love people, they're interested in people, but you can't really teach people about math. <laughs> Awesome. All right. That's pretty cool. All right. So I think we'll move on. So unless anyone else has any additional career insights that they'd like to share, which I, I love consuming these, but all right. This is my little spiel. I don't think it quite applies to you guys. These guys sound a little bit more advanced than I was looking for. But so uh, one of the things that I usually tell my class is to write down your attack plan on paper, which I always sort of like people <laughs> are very reluctant or resistant to this, and I'm not sure why, but um, the default seems to be like start banging away on the keyboard and hope goodness comes out, right? <laughs> which it very rarely does unless you're highly skilled. Um, and so I have personally found this to be more effective. Um, and the way that I get away with this, I mentioned earlier that I spend about 60% of my time in meetings. Most of those meetings are bad. And when I mean bad, I mean like I have to be there, but they're not a good use of my time. And so that's where I do a lot of my programming is in a meeting on paper, right? which totally looks like I'm being engaged and productive. And I am being productive, <laughs> but I might not be engaged. Right? <laughs> and so, so there's a great sort of use of my time as far as like designing the programs that I will need that when I get back to my computer, I'm way more productive and efficient at the computer. Right? So that, that's a, a little tidbit that I'll share. All right. So again, I, I think that um, you might all be familiar with a lot of these tools or not, but I wouldn't 
about it in the sense that um, you can have a fear of knowing that there's more that you don't know, and that's problematic. And so personally, I try to focus on a few languages like, um, I'm sorry, there's one more tidbit here. So there's the fear, and then there's the, the, the consequence of that, not knowing. And when you don't know, it means you cannot communicate effectively with other people who know something different. But yeah, so the way that I handle both of these, I try and focus on a few things, like sort of focus on Python, but even within Python, you still have this problem of there's a plethora of tools within Python. So does Darren teach R or Python or something else? Okay, so this is like, I think, a pretty common sort of rebellion against the problem of diversity. But then even within Python, you still get diversity. So. All right, but so why do we use all these libraries is because I like to be super lazy. Laziness is a positive trait, right? It means you can be more effective doing the things that you should be doing, not wasting your time being ineffective. So these libraries, you're basically reusing someone else's implementation. You have to know about their implementation and how to use it, but it hopefully it saves you time. So, all right, if you haven't read The Programmer's Virtues, it's totally a good read, very short, good stuff. So that, in addition to psychologists and programming, philosophers in programming, those are the people who come up with like ideas like that. Uh, ten years old. Yes. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I just I saw this since ninety one. So, so yeah, like, Python is since ninety one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This just blows my sock off how old Python 3 is because, like, people are still switching to it. <laughs> like, my, my Mac has Python 2 on it. I just don't get it. Like, all right. All right. Another, um, for my students, this is, and I don't know whether you've encountered this yourself, but my students, like, I'll show them this code snippet and they're like, how did you know all those magic incantations? And I'm like, I didn't. <laughs> right? How did that happen? So. First, I went and wrote the first line of like load the CSV using pandas, and then that fails, right? Because like it chokes on whatever, um, like it's looking for index, right? And like then I have to add in, I have to find the magic incantation, and iteratively build that, and then like it fails on something else, and so like this is like a nightmare scenario where I have uh, five magic incantations on top of the thing that I intended to do. So in the end, what you get is an output that looks very sort of like magical. It's not. It's just an iterative development. And so this may this may look like it's just a few characters, but it's hours of work. So if you have encountered that yourself as a practitioner, don't feel bad. Or maybe it's just a reflection that I'm really stupid. I'm not sure. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back to the morals. Um, I like to enable reproducibility as a person who likes science. And so one way of doing that is making sure that other people can do what I did. <laughs> right? If, if they have to charge $10,000 to get the software that I use, that's not a good sort of reproducibility moral. Right? Right. As I've maybe in, engaged with you before, uh, data science is more than te technical stuff. All right, I think I have a Hopefully, a, a little exercise coming up. So, the the issue um, that I see a lot is that you'll have to iterate with customers. And if you've done software development, you're this. But um, <laughs> what I have seen from my students is that they've been at the university where uh, an assignment is is you know created by the instructor, and then a deadline is provided, and the student does the work and turns it in to the, the teacher. Like, that's the routine. But that's not how right life actually works, in the sense that, like, it doesn't have a well defined assignment. They don't even have a well defined criteria for evaluation for success. And so it's like every day, or every few hours, talking to the customer, I did this thing, do you like this thing? And then the customer says yes or no, if, you, if you're lucky, right? Typically, your customer is unavailable. <laughs> In which case, you've got now this dilemma of, 
well, I don't really want to proceed without checking in with my customer, but my customer doesn't respond to my email, and so what do I do? So hopefully you've got someone on your team who can figure that out for you, because uh, if, if you're sort of soldiering along for weeks or months without checking in with your customer, because either they're unavailable or you don't want to talk to them as a data scientist, uh, that'll be problematic. Oh yeah, so <laughs> so this is a, a thing that happened to me about a month ago now, where I had a customer, and I, I just, <laughs> I'll spam the death out of my customers, right? Like they will just see emails from me nonstop. And so one of the things was, I did some exploration on a data set, and I just, you know, there wasn't any result even. It was just like, I'm doing a thing. I emailed my customer and they immediately emailed back like, holy crap, that's amazing, right? I'm just like, what? I just did some normal stuff in Pandas. It wasn't like, like magical. But the problem was they were working in Excel. And so their mindset was shaped by the tools they're using. And so they didn't have any conception that you could operate on a million lines in a data space, right? That's the thing that they don't think about. And so when I sort of like, oh yeah, you just do this transform on this million lines and they're just like, what, right? <laughs> and so it was really useful to check in with the customer and say like, I did a thing and I don't even have a result necessarily, but like if it's outside of their paradigm of their conception of what's normal, that can provide value to them, right? Because it has just, there wasn't a result to be delivered in sort of an artifact sense, but it was more like, here's something that changes how you think about problems, <laughs> which is more important. Right. So how to, I don't know how to teach that skill, but I'm advocating that it's a useful thing to check in with your customers because they might not have the same perspective on the tool that you do as a data scientist. All right. All right. So th <laughs> this is uh, the, the point there that I didn't have something that was perfect. I sort of had a thing and I just shoved it off to the customer. Great. Now we have an activity. So the 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 problem that I am probably restating over and over here is that a technical skill set is only a fraction of your real work, and working with people is very useful. So what I'm going to advocate is that a lot of your work will be spent getting data. And it is very rare someone will walk up to you and say, "You know, Ryan, I have a problem for you." I need this solution, here's the data, some compute resources to do the problem on, right? That never happens. <laughs> and so like one of the negotiations that I do a lot of is identifying not only what the problem is, but who has the data. And then surprisingly, this is the thing that will shock you maybe, is that they don't want to give you the data. <laughs> Great, I got at least one look that's like, what the? <laughs> so, problem is, the person with, and I think I don't, yeah, okay, so the, the, the problem is the person with the data has typically had that data for many, many years, and they've had that data right as part of their work role, and you're showing up as this new, unknown person, right, who represents actually to that data owner a lot of risk in the sense of the data owner will likely lose power, right, in the organization because the person with the data has the power, and if you come along and you say, hey, I can analysis of your data if you just give me a copy, which financially doesn't cost them anything, but now they're less likely to get promoted, right, because they handed you all their gold. <laughs> and, and so this danger is that you're taking the glory from their position because they have the data, even if they can't do the analysis. And so, there's this weird position of like, well, can't you just give me the data? Like it doesn't cost you anything, right? But the risk is there for them. And the other experience that they may have is that as a owner, someone else may have come along before you and sort of like poison the well of like, give us your data and we'll do good things with it. And then they screw over the data owner and guess how much more likely the data owner is to give you a copy of the data? Less likely, right? And so if the person has been burned previously by interactions, you're going to face a harder challenge of getting a copy of the data. Any questions on that before? Me? Okay. So, the the activity for you this evening will be to figure out one of we're going to split into groups, and we're going to have a group of data owners, a group of um, 
people who want to get the data. And then we'll split into those two groups. We'll talk about the, each, each group's roles. And after that, we're going to take those two groups and split into pairs. So we'll have each, each pair of people will have one data owner and one data requester. And we'll try and negotiate and see who gets the data. Does that make sense? Question? So I'm going to give you the data requesters. I'm going to do that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we'll need six data requesters. So I'll start off. But I don't need to do You can hand those back. Yeah. All right, so take a moment to get a piece of paper and then read up on it. This is your role for the partner activity, but first we're going to sort of like talk as data owners and sort of like figure out what the strategy is. Right? And the data requesters over on this side will talk about like how are we going to get that data in their pair. All right. Data requesters, sit over there for a moment. Data owners, do you have any questions for me? What you're working on? You just don't give them data, that's all. Yeah. That's it. That's all it is. You said no. No, you're just the manager. We're just the manager. Sorry. Well, you have skills. <laughs> Yeah, they're not they're not in data analysis. Questions <laughs> over here on this group? Technically Is there any financial cost or is it just all you guys have that's within the organization? Yeah, so we're all in the same organization, let's say, right? But we're on different teams basically. All right. So I'm gonna let you randomly up, I will not try to find you, but you know, talk with someone who is a data owner. So let's pair up. I don't know, however, you want to do that randomly. But. So every data owner should be with a data requester and vice versa. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to sort of get that data or not give that data. I know, right? Physically? A lot of exercise. Yeah. Killing you. Yeah. 
about the exercise itself. Observations about how that negotiation went. Is that a thing that you've done before? <laughs> okay, so we've not done it before. So we'll disperse back to our regular desk. <laughs> yeah, if, so if I has gone, so who here has not heard of fake or synthetic data? Everyone's heard of fake data? Yeah. So so fake data is totally useful because you can come to the person who has the data already 
and sort of advertise your portfolio of skill sets and potential outcomes so that you could say, I've already built all the infrastructure that does the analysis. We know what the results could be, right, with this synthetic or fake data. And that potentially gives some sort of conception to the data owner that they have more trust in your skill set and what the outcomes are, right? So this is a very common tactic that all employees will say, like, <laughs> I actually did all the analysis already. You just need to give me what the actual values are, right? Which sounds like an, a smaller risk to the data owner. <laughs> but it's no different than the original request, right? I'm just like, give me all your data. It just sounds smaller. Like if you show them a portfolio of graphs, you'd be like, I can give you this. Yeah, and I don't, so I don't know what, so like a spreadsheet of numbers is just harder for them to understand that that's also data. But yeah, pie charts, totally cool. Mm -hmm. All right, so <laughs> I guess in my experience, Almost always, the root cause of this reluctance is not because they're busy, but because they have this underlying fear of something, right? Fear of not getting promoted if they get rid of their data, fear of like getting in trouble, right? And so, the common tactic that I'll try and like, the common sort of method that I'll take is try to uncover what that fear is. And if you can figure out what the data owner is fearing and directly address that, then they're happy to talk with you, right? I'm so, pretty sure no one's going to admit that, oh, if I give you the data, it's not, I'm not going to get promoted. <laughs> OK, I, ha I will counter that with facts of I did that. <laughs> so I had so two different instances. One was the person, um, <laughs> and I can tell you who later, but the, the person um, was fearful that if I did all the analysis, so they were in charge of like doing the analysis. They literally don't have the skills to do the analysis. And so the problem is, if I did the analysis, why would that person get promoted, right? That was the problem. So, Can you say <laughs> not in words. <laughs> right. I mean, I've been in an experience where I kind of suspected that was the case because they're like, oh, it's cool, and they want to know what we're doing, but they didn't really want to work with us. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like they're trying to take our ideas so yep. they can do it. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, actually. Like this is what I fear. <laughs> Those words are very rarely uttered, right? <laughs> so yeah. But, that's also a great place to like kind of like this is a win-win, you know? Like, this is a really unique project. And I appreciate it. And you have that subject knowledge and subject matter expertise. We are not do it without you. Like it's it's us together. I even go one further. So usually what I'll do is I'll say like. I will do the analysis and you will get the credit. Like, don't yeah. even cite me, right? Usually, I'm not there for the glory, right? Like, the, my, my manager or my boss, they already know what I'm doing. So it's not like some surprise to them, usually. <laughs> but um, so usually, they've already blessed my activities, right? And like what I'm supposed to be doing. And so when I go off to this person, I don't even care about receiving the credit, right? Because if they're on a different team reporting to a different boss, that's outside of my chain of command. I don't care that they take credit for the work. And so usually I'll try and like, as much as I can say like, don't even mention me, right? Like I'm just behind the scenes helping you be more productive. So that's even further than just saying like it's a win-win. Like <laughs> I don't even care about it. Let me do it, right? I love it. <laughs> so. All right, sanity checks. This is another sort of underrated, highly valued topic for me. Um, as I've mentioned before, <laughs> it takes a lot of time not only to get the data, but to clean the data. Right? And in the end, you're hopefully going to have clean data that you do analysis on and pre present results about. But if those results miss the point of the person who is trying to consume it, then you've already failed in your job and you've wasted a bunch of your time. So, um, oops, and I got another little hit here. My bad. So if you're familiar with CSVs, could tell me what's wrong with this one? Yes. All right. All right. Anyone else? 
Perfect. So the points that were being made here is that these values were received. So you need to have some sort of thing denoting that there's a comma there. All right. So so this is like a pretty normal sort of cleaning operation that you might have to detect. I'd say that's normal. <laughs> Luckily, less rarely is something that I encountered a few weeks ago, um, where the header of this large CSV with about 40,000 rows in it was comma separated. And then all the following rows, the first column was separated by a one, and then the following entries were uh, pipe separated. <laughs> Am I not making sense yet? No. It's not. <laughs> there, so I do not quite understand how this came into existence, but I can sort of guess, right? Someone thought it would be a good idea. They saw some like colon in one of the downstream fields and they inserted pipes as just like munging together data sets. This is the sort of thing that I sadly encounter. Very, very sad. And I actually gave this to my students as a problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So <laughs> the the other observation that I'll make here is that just because you get data doesn't mean that it's useful. There's a bunch of sort of questions that you should ask about, is this trustworthy? But the main um, content that I'm going to focus on in this section is what I call sanity checks. And so these are things that numerically and formatting-wise are totally acceptable. Right? The computer would be totally happy to accept the price of this PICAP bar or whatever that is. Um, as $130,000. So there's nothing wrong with that, except if you're a human actually buying candy bars, right? <laughs> and then on the other spectrum, right, things that cost an unreasonably small amount of money or fractions of a cent, you know, good sort of thing to have in them, right? And so these are things that you should check for when you're cleaning the data. But again, cleaning data, you, you typically think of it as back to these sort of issues of formatting. There's a whole category of things that are formatted but also wrong. Right. So again, a fun little sort of observation is like if I have 15 of 28 buses arriving within a few seconds of each other, that's totally acceptable from a formatting perspective. There's nothing wrong with that other than it's not probably likely. And again, Detecting these little anomalies usually does not occur when you first look at the data set. Right? The, the data as presented to you, you think everything's formatted, it was read as a CSV or an you know, XML file, totally good to go. Right? Usually where these sorts of issues uh, show up is after you've done your analysis and maybe even when you're presenting to your customer. And so that's like one of the worst times to, to find a little mistake in your data is that, oh yeah, the data is improbable, right? <laughs> and and your analytics hopefully may catch something like that, but often your customer with that subject matter expertise, that domain expertise, will immediately recognize as being unreasonable. All right. Someone could tell me what's wrong with this uh, the CSV. Nothing's wrong with the CSV. It's the interpretation of the content that's confusing. So I, I can't I can measure miles. As, as a sort of unit distance, forces as a unit for time, I, I'm just not familiar with that basis. And then what does 4.2 horses of time mean? So, so this is totally reasonable to slice up a horse, but I still don't get time from it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Is that you actually have to have some, like this is the human part of data science, right? Is that like, how do we understand whether something is sensical or not, other than the basis of we're being humans? Back to 4.2 cows, you could totally slice that up. But. So there are other anomalies that will show up in your data that, again, there's nothing wrong with those ages unless those are the only ages showing up in a large database. And then it's not that you always want some sort of flat thing going on or some like bimodal distribution or whatever fancy curve you have. You have things that actually should fluctuate. And so if you're looking for things that should fluctuate, 
again, that relies on your human intuition of the seasons or days of the week, right? Or the days of the hour. And these are things that you'll have to pick out of your data as being sensical or not. All right, so there's lots of um, text problems that arise that again aren't problems from a formatting perspective, but just don't quite make sense. Right? So like the names sort of being obvious that you can write a check for, but you normally wouldn't parse your data to check for those problems. All right, so this is sort of a summary of all the things that I covered. And so it looks like a relatively small list, but each one of these will kill you right when you're presenting to the customer, and they're just like, buses don't arrive within seconds of each other. Right. All right, time for a check-in. So find a partner, someone you have not talked to recently. <laughs> Richard, I'm killing you with this physical activity, aren't I? Yeah. Apologize. All right, someone you have not talked to, talk to them. <laughs> Someone you have not talked to recently. <laughs> it's been a really big night. How do you how do you force that into the large organizations? <laughs> I don't know. We were still dealing with that Paris, where we talked to some organizations and we got a model and we're like, oh, so it's done now, right? Like, <laughs> Walk away. No, it's not. It's an ongoing thing. It's not just here's your model. It's text model. It's not all. So you like realistic data analyst jobs to see over and to data science. Yeah. Yeah, most businesses want the analyst, but they don't know that. No one wants to invest in the heavy overhead of doing science because it's very costly. But they want people who can crunch numbers and make profit. Science is cost yeah. That's a subset of their skill. One's a subset of the other. Yeah. I feel like yeah. a data analyst will do the yeah. answer. Yeah. And done for the data scientists and they explain them that that's not quite right. You should check this out again. Let me try something else. Or the methodology changes or yeah. Yeah. Or it's so I this is one to either analyst or scientist really want that pay for the analyst. That's a good distinction. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we'll come back. Uh me. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps. All right. So we'll come back. And uh, actually, I'm not done. Uh, sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so some more pro tips from the field, basically. Um, one of the things that I try to practice is having multiple efforts running at the same time. And that can lead you to be a little bit scatterbrained if you have too many of them. But I usually try and balance about three to five. And what that allows me to do is when I get bored with something, switch to something else that's interesting. Right? So that's sort of like one benefit. But um, more importantly, when one of those efforts fails, as it invariably should, in the sense of it, doing things that only succeed, then you're not taking any risk. You're not gaining any new knowledge, right? Because you're doing things that are known. And so as a data scientist, I will claim that half your projects should be expected to fail. 
If you're not failing at that rate, you should do something more that stretches your knowledge or stretches the, the data that you have, right? And like, like forces you into some unknown territory where you have a slightly higher failure rate. So pay attention to where your failure rate is so that you can figure out, am I playing it too safe? Am I being too risky? Where should I find that balance? And so if you know that half your projects are going to fail, hopefully, that's your expectation, then you don't want to like fail and stop. Like, oh God, now what am I doing, right? Like panic, like I don't have anything else going on. And so the way that I balance it out is I have a collection of small projects that I can go between. And so when one of them fails, it's only a third of my work, not 100%. All right. Um, does anyone here know about or not know about MD5 hashes? Everyone knows MD5 hashes. Oh, we have one no, two no's, three no's. Perfect, great, four, five. So, <laughs> so one of the problems that I encountered with my was that I posted a 1.5 megabyte file. That's relatively small in the overall scheme of things. And the problem was that the student received the file and said it's not working as it should. Right? I'm like, well, I can't come over to your house and figure out what's wrong with it. And so the purpose of an MD5 hash is that you have a function that you apply to a file and it returns you back a small alphanumeric string. And so usually about 20 characters of A's and B's and C's and D's and E's and two, three, four, five, right? So like if I put my file into this function and it returns, so I put a file and it turns back a string, right? So like A to nine, right? This is a small string that represents some output or a function on, on my input. So this is my file. And so the utility, so why is that useful? The point of this is that if I have a slightly modified version of this file, so we'll call it file time, or maybe in that 1.5 megabyte file, I've literally changed one character. As a human, that would be super hard to figure out. Like which of these million characters is different? Oh, that one. No, that's not like it. And so the utility of an MD5 hash is when you run it through that same function, it outputs a radically different string, hopefully. So right? this is maybe like B, uh, C, 0, 5, E. Right? And so this string is very visibly different. And so the point of this is that if I give my student a file, and then tell them, run the MD5 hash, and you should get this string back. They run their file through that function, and they get some very different string back. This is very visibly different. What it indicates, it doesn't tell you where the difference is. It merely indicates that the file is, in fact, different. So this is useful because you're going to probably be working with really big data sets. And how do you know, How does that? where is that confidence that the thing that you started with is what you have next to you, or the week after that? Right? or the thing that your customer gave you is what you have now. Right? And so having some confidence that your file hasn't changed is really important when you're working with usually large data sets that are inconvenient to access. And it's really embarrassing to go back to the customer and be like, oh, I lost data, or it was corrupted, and I don't even know where it is now. Right? So those are things that you, as a person who is responsible for your data, you don't, those are conversations you want to avoid. So making sure that your inputs are consistent and haven't changed over time, it's a useful skill. Questions on that? What code is it on? Hmm? What code is it on? The code? What's the code? That's code. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just giving <laughs> Extra credit, you can correct it. <laughs> okay. Uh oh, an activity. <laughs> We're going to hang up by five. We're going to have five people. Well, so we come off by four then. One. Zero. Zero. Oh, you're going to be over here. Better. One. No, you're one. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I beat that. One. Two. Three, four. One. Two. Three. Four. One. Two. Three. Four. All right. Get with your group.
And I would advise in this exercise to have lots of separation with lots of decimal space. Yeah, so open up your little packets. And what you have is a set of tasks that, as a data scientist, you will have to be doing. Lunch? Lunch? <laughs> well, you have more than lunch, hopefully. Right there. Oh. All right, so the goal for this task is to prior linearly prioritize the activities. So I'm not telling you what the project is. This is, should be generic. <laughs> and the order chronological, it's an importance. So start every day. There should be some some blank ones that are trying to get it. Who said one day? This is for your project. Oh, that's a real project. You really prioritize your project. So we can only keep one lunch. One time project. Oh, that's hard. We could sleep as one. Yeah, if you have blank tabs, I mean, you get to define your task. Wow. It's like promotion. Oh, yes. That is like at the top. Yes. Yeah. You want the like top value task? I think it could be. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. 
coexist, yes. Yeah. So you can do stuff with that. Well, that's so far, the highest. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Okay, so yeah, determine value in the prioritized tasks of China to bear with the end of China. We don't need days. Check with the legal team. Because, I mean, if it's not doing anything sensitive, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's no need to check. I need the legal team. Describe to a sales. Yeah, whatever. I mean, we have different kinds of stuff that customers that need to have sell and stuff. We have the right software to that. I don't know if we're doing sales and marketing. Yeah, can we have no resource that is in files? We could play games. It might be the developer. We might not. It might be both situations. Yeah, I think that goes really high with values. Right. It's like, let's say you're paying some of these dollars. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
Lunch and promotion. Yeah. Hey, is there you a different list? Or? <laughs> 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 I'm the same list. Come back. Second. Uh, yes, get data. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then we'll do the same on the low side. So what do you have for your low side? What's the lowest? Add team members. And pro team. All right. <laughs> you guys have a low? Right code. Man. This group. What is happening? Do you know what business people are doing? No. Yes, all right. Low party? <laughs> this is like my oh man, you guys kill me here. Gather book All right, I will explain that one later. Do I don't have any seconds of sort of Yeah, yeah. Everybody had the same list, by the way. So no, no talk. So a couple meta observations about this game, right? So like. Organization totally neglects the aspect that you can have concurrent things going on in the team, right? So obviously that puts it there. The other thing that I would like to point out is that as a team, you didn't all agree initially, and you might not all agree at this point, right after negotiation. And this is one of the big challenging things in a team is that you have a bunch of smart people who all think they're smart. That's also dangerous, but then they all have to go do a thing, right? And they don't agree on what the priorities are. So this is a really useful conversation to have with your team. So if your team does not agree about how to proceed, highly unlikely that your team is going to succeed unless it's a bunch of individuals acting as individuals, right? And that's not really a team. That's a bunch of individuals. So a couple observations there. On Rails, have any sort of insights from this activity? Most of these things are important. <laughs> They're all relevant. Right? Yes. Yes, definitely. But it's like really hard to put things in the bottom category. It's like that, you got to do that to <laughs> yeah. someone has to. You can't drop it. Too. Yeah. Other things that I have. Anyone else want to add to that? You don't have lunch. You don't have lunch. <laughs> that you can't function. <laughs> Another thing that I would that I would advocate for in this oh. in this exercise is that as a data a team, right? You also have to negotiate with your boss what their priority is, right? Because maybe as a team of data scientists with some education, you may be aware of things your boss is not, and vice versa, right? Your boss may be aware of things that your team is not. And so that prioritization depends on your chain of command. Second, your customer, right? Maybe your customer has a priority and you should talk to them, right? Because as a team of data scientists, you may not have that domain exposure to know what the real fire, the hair on fire issues are, right? So again, having that conversation very explicit within your team, with your boss, with your customer, and guess what? Nobody's going to agree. Again, it comes back to negotiation and communication about what do people think the priority is and what do people think the lowest priority is. Because like, so and a little tidbit here, what is gather book for me? I mean, I have emphasized that, but back in the science slide. Yeah. I, I'm assuming you're, you're making a reference to like checking in on the cultural culture and to kind of operate within the, the confines of the I would. I don't adhere to the normal conventions of my culture, but um, the thing that I'm advocating here is so typically you'll wander in. Someone will. You'll eventually get an Excel spreadsheet of data, right? And then now you have to analyze that data set. Well, typically, someone who's been working on the floor for 20 years knows what the actual story is, right? And you could spend hours, if not months, of your time cleaning that data and figuring out what that data tells you. You may or may not come to the right conclusion. But it's usually, I have found, easier to talk to someone who has experience doing the thing. They have stories. And those stories may or may not be confirmed in the data that you have access to. But those are much easier starting points because they, they, they tell you what you should either confirm or invalidate in the data set. And so for me, personally, gathering the folklore means talking to the practitioners to understand what they think I should look Right? And sometimes they're right, which is most of the time because they've been doing it, practicing it. Right? And then sometimes their folklore is wrong, in which case I get to go checking back with them before I talk to the boss. Right? Because maybe I interpret the data wrong, it's the most often the case. Right? But if I find something that, hey, what you thought was going on in your story 
is actually not backed up by the data. So first, as, a, as an employee, you should know that. And then we should alert your boss, right? Either the employee alerts their boss or I alert the boss of like, hey, the pool floor you're operating on, the decision basis you have is invalid. And that always hurts, but it's like gathering the pool floor is that starting point of like, what do people think right now? All right, anyone else have any questions? So there are a bunch of tabs that I'm gonna have questions about things that are right on the tab, I like that. Besides going to lunch. What was it? Did you have a question about that? Oh, no, that's not good. Did other people actually have meetings with the Because that's a lot. I don't know why I'm believing this. <laughs> so if you can take your tabs and then shuffle them back into the little binder clips, I would appreciate that. Yeah. And then we're on break. The time flies. Uh, we'll come back at nine oh one. Yeah, Tyler Simon is an instructor? Yeah. He's my coworker. Really? Yeah. Uh, programming. Parallel programming, right? Yeah, he does parallel yes. programming in the market conversation. Yes. How do you like him? He's a funny guy. Funny? Funny. He's a lot of jokes. Seriously? Tell him you said that, So no, it looked like no one left for break other than just leaving. How many? Hmm? Yeah. All right. This is the question that will come in like 10 slides, so. <laughs> but we'll come back to that. Uh, where was I? Did that? Right. So these are sort of the meta observations and then automation. I'm not. Ooh. Let's see. So I'm going to fire up a notebook here that may or may not work. Do you guys use Docker for your Jupyter notebooks? Do you, okay. do you use Jupyter? Yes. Do you run your Jupyter notebook of a Docker image? You use Colab? Okay. Okay. So I so recently this is like now we're off tangent, but recently I started um, building a Docker container that has all the things that my students need. Right. So it has. It will have Spark. It has um, Python. Obviously, it has Jupyter and R. But then it has all the like the package dependencies resolved, and it has GraphViz and like PyCallGraph and like a bunch of other packages. So that all is being built up. Maybe, yeah. And then the fun. Have, have you guys heard of uh, Neo4j? No. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a graph software to so like nodes and edges and pictures and things. 
but the nodes and edges can have attributes. So it's a property graph. So I just recently figured out how to get that with a, so I'm running the Neo4j code out of a Docker container and then also a separate Docker container with Jupyter in it and then having those connections. The goal is, my goal for this is to have all of the things that my students will need in one Docker image that they can then download and play with and it will contain all the things. Let's see, substitute. Uh, I'm not even sure that it's. Do one question. All right. Well, we'll come back to that when the appropriate time strikes and then see if it works. All right. So the last segment here, which will not take 40 minutes, um, is on automation. This is another sort of like best practices in data science that I feel is underrepresented in most classes, which is why I'm telling you about it tonight. So what I look for as a data scientist are things that are repetitive. And if those are repetitive, then it's a question of how much investment would I need to make in order to automate that task. And if the task automation takes longer than the repetitive thing, then don't do that, obviously. But most of the time, the investment in automation pays off. Uh, that was not supposed to be Oh, yeah, yeah. OK, so that's so the, the story here is that um, there are channels through which you, as a data scientist, interact with other people, whether it's your boss, your customer, or the data scientist. So exchanging emails and presentations and data, those are all things that you should expect as a data scientist to do. Right? So nothing shocking on this slide other than the fact that if you're doing each one of those things manually, then you're not automating it. Right? So like, how many people here can send an email automatically? Or make a telephone call automatically? right? Or Generate a PowerPoint presentation with all of your results in it without having to actually do the manual work of doing the generation, right? So all those things that you commonly do, if you don't know how to automate them, you're stuck doing them manually. And the consequence of that is you can only produce things manually at a certain rate, right? Like my keyboard hand skills are not that fast. And so like if I want, if my boss wants one report a week, the reason they're asking for that is because that's what they think is a reasonable use of my time. That doesn't necessarily indicate that's how often they want the report. They may act on a live web dashboard, but they don't actually know that to ask for that because they wouldn't know how to do that. Right? And so they're used to asking for a weekly activity report in email because that's what they would do. So if you don't know that automation is a thing, then you're probably going to seek a manual solution. So eyeballs aren't good enough. So, so that's the problem is that if you can't automate something, <laughs> good. <laughs> whoop, whoop. <laughs> All right. So the point there is um, it's worth investing your time to learn how to automate each one of these commonly used channels. All right. So this is the big takeaway for this little segment is that as an example, I mean, I can tell you how to automate all the I'll focus on email because I think it's the most vital. It's a very commonly used uh, communication channel. We'll see if I can pull it off. All right, so a little bit of context here. Normally, so if you normally use email, you'd have to be familiar with what's called SMTP. So this is the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. And there's a set of commands that you would issue to the email server. It would acknowledge your existence. You'd put in your username and password. And via the command line, you'd be able to interact with your mail server. Now, why is that useful, right? No one likes banging with man prompt unless you're a bash script, right? Or something that can automatically interact with a server, in which case maybe I could write a Python script to log into the email server and send emails on my behalf, right? That's much more efficient than me going into Outlook and having to type all the emails. But <laughs> here's the caveat. <laughs> Who here has Gmail? Everyone should raise their hand, right? Because we're at UMBC and UMBC uses Gmail. So you may not know that, but hopefully do. Um, 
<laughs> so the problem is Gmail does not present an SMTP interface for their web service. So when you're logging into email on Gmail, there are only two ways to do it. One is via the web interface, and the other is via an API. And their API is custom for Gmail. So that means you have to learn the API and how to use you know, send an email for Gmail. But it is possible. So the first thing that we need to do is um, authorize my account to interact with Gmail over the uh, API. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I don't know if I have to continue. It might not work out. It'd be very, very sad. Mm. Maybe I can do it in my notebook. That may be a slight musical interlude here. Thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe that will help out. Right. So the great thing about running in a container is every time you load the Docker image, it has a uh, ephemeral data that I lose every time I close the session. So I have to reinstall the packages part of the document. Hmm. Let's see, not some GMA. This works. This is the fun part of live demos, right? That works. <laughs> <laughs> I do like showing off something. Well, Python 3 is what I'll do. Maybe. I think I may be stuck. All right, in which case, you will not actually see me send an email via this, this script. But basically, what this um, Python script was supposed to do is run these set of commands. And what it does is when it calls the Gmail API, the first thing that happens is it opens a web page to authorize the association of that um, API with my account. And so then I bless that via web GUI, and then I proceed, and the rest of this is all through the notebook. So the authentication and approval process is a one-time act that I bless this interaction via the API. The rest of it is to your heart's content automated. So I will assume that I have authenticated, although I'm a little sad that it didn't work this time. Um, but the, the point here is that email um, has some nuances associated with that protocol. So one of them being that it doesn't send plain text. It actually has to base in 64 encode your text, which is something you don't have to care about unless you're actually sending email as a machine, right? In which case, that's what we're doing. So this first cell up here is showing that I think a string and when I change the encoding for it, it looks like a garbled bunch of stuff. So not, you don't care other than the fact that it just has to happen. Um, and then these are functions that I've stolen from, the, from Google's Gmail API documentation. Right? So all I'm doing here is paste some code in with a few modifications. Basically, this function here, um, I, I tell it um, who I'm sending to. This is the email address of the to and the from and the subject. And then the string is encoded as a base 64 text. And then that's what, that is the body of the email, basically. There's no sort of like fancy stuff that, like usually there's a bunch of other garbage that goes with your email, but we're just doing a to from subject and the, and the URL, or so the, the text. And then what I do is I compose a message that is, uh, to this account from this account. And, and then you, know, you could send things to other domains besides Gmail, but this game we're just staying within. And then that text message um, gets translated into this gobbledygook here. So the next um, part of this activity is it sets up a session for 
sending the message. And then so it's all there. And you can have a copy of these notebooks when we're done. They actually do work when you're not on my computer. And so then um, after you've set up the connection, this cell nine up here is about authenticating using a token that was the outcome of that your authentication interactivity. And so that JSON file is being passed of saying, hey, these are my credentials, just FYI. And then we send our message. And that message gets sent, so that's cell 10. So I'm sending it as me, like I'm using the authentication that I set up. And I'm sending that message, MSG. And then it gets sent. And as just sort of like a proof of, yes, this really did work at one point, um, I will take a search through my email for that. So you can see what it looks like. You can see I was successful on October 29th, apparently, because um, so I sent a message as a subject and a to and a from, right? And that's that's um, what you can do from Python. So that's sort of interesting. I'm a little sad that it didn't work at this point. I didn't test it out but for this class. Uh, right, and you're thinking, so what? Right now we can send emails. That's cool, but it's not all of the things. So the second sort of like tip that I'll give you is an SMS gateway. Anyone heard of that before? One yes? Two yeses. OK. So an SMS gateway, if you're not familiar with it, I'm going to pull up the Wikipedia entry. Basically what it does is every single cell phone provider for the United States has an SMS gateway. And we'll pull up the table here. And the consequence of this is if you know who's uh, if you know someone's cell phone and you don't know who their provider is, you can compose an email to an address that would get sent to their phone as a text message. So, like, let's say I had the number, the phone number, 1234, that was my phone number for me, and my provider is Telex. Then if I sent an email to 1234 at msg.telex.com, then that message would be delivered to that person's phone as a text Super cool, right? The consequence is you can now send an email automated in Python, which also means if you know about SMS gateways, you can send text messages from Python. So that's cool. So when someone asks you for like those live things, like you don't have to be there at 3 a.m. like monitoring the computer. So that's nice. Um, you can write a, and if you, do we have you guys covered Markov chains? Okay. So, so you, you take some blob of text and you feed it into this magical box called the Markov chain generator. And then like it speeds you back new strings, new sentences, based on the old content that are sort of like scrambled, but still sensical, right? <laughs> so what I would advocate is take a set of weekly activity reports, right, which contain text, run it through a Markov chain generator, to get new weekly activity reports and then automate your emails and you'll never have to do weekly activity reports. <laughs> so, so you laugh, but <laughs> so this has been done uh, where I work with um, sort of promotion papers because no one reads those, right? And so you might as well have a machine gun write them. So good times. So I'm going to end class on this, this activity. Unfortunately, I don't think you'll have paper. You can pass out a couple of those. And if you need time, I have time. So there's two sides to a piece of paper, not six. Um, and so if you can write down what in this class you learned and what was not clear, then I will be a better teacher next time that I teach someone else. Any pen?
Golden. Okay, so if you're paying attention on the screen, I just figured out how to recover from my previous error. So I was able to launch the Python script, which seeks the application to interact with the API. So I'm going to click Allow, and then we'll see if this works. Maybe. No, we're not going to take that. Woo. Woo All right. Authenticated with the key. So now, hypothetically, good question, should be able to run the rest of this code in the cells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just executing all the cells, no big surprise there. And then this last one is send the message. Looks like it was happy. So back to email, let's see if new mail shows up. Take a little bit. Boom. You guys see that? New message showed up. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. I will take your commentary. So it's great you didn't send that email, but what, what example of things are you emailing? 